Funding for Yale Cancer Answers is provided by Smilo Cancer Hospital. Welcome to Yale Cancer Answers with Dr. Eric Weiner. Yale Cancer Answers features conversations with oncologists and specialists who are on the forefront of the battle to fight cancer. This week, it's a conversation about cancer genetic testing and prevention with Dr. Veda Geary. Dr. Geary is a professor of internal medicine and medical oncology at the Yale School of Medicine. Here's Dr. Weiner. So um, before we get going and talk more about genetics, can you just tell us a little bit um, about um, your background? Uh, where did you work before Yale? I know you've only been here for a couple of years because I personally recruited you. And, um, and, and, and how did you get interested in genetics and cancer genetics? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, so to start with, so I'm a medical oncologist and cancer doctor, and my focus in clinical work and research has been in cancer genetics. Um, I first actually became interested in cancer genetics in medical school, uh, thinking about how genetics explains the codes for our bodies and how they function and how diseases can arise. Um, after medical school, I went on to do my residency um, and fellowship in internal medicine and hematology oncology at University of Michigan. And there I did more research in uh, genetics, particularly for prostate cancer. Uh, which really like brought that interest back in terms of cancer genetics. Um, after my training, I went on to Fox Chase Cancer Center, uh, where I got more deep, uh, deeper in-depth training in cancer risk assessment. What does genetics mean for implementing this in clinical care for risk and management, and um, uh, really in terms of now these days for treatment. Um, after that, I went to Thomas Jefferson University to lead and develop their uh, comprehensive cancer genetics program. And subsequently, two years ago, as you mentioned, came to Yale. Well, thanks. Um, sometimes people think about cancer as being almost uniformly a genetic disease because the genes in a cancer um, are somewhat different than the genes in the rest of our bodies. But when you're talking about cancer genetics um, and inherited cancer genetics, that's a little different. And can you explain that? Yes, that's a really great question. So really, cancer can be thought of as a genetic disease, but the uh, the way that that genetics uh, happens is what you're really describing, which there's a difference between inherited genetics and what's called somatic or let's say tumor genetics. Um, here, what we're really talking about are inherited or germline genetics. About 10 to 15 percent of cancers are due to an inherited genetic mutation. And what can happen is these genes, these cancer genes, uh, they are actually meant to stop cancers from happening. And so when we inherit a mutation or a change in one of those genes, that function can actually be interrupted. And there can be higher risk of cancers occurring if we have an inherited genetic mutation in a cancer gene. Um, and these days, of course, it can be really informative for treatment. But there is a difference between what is inherited and the genetics of tumors themselves. And these mutations that occur are almost like a sentence that isn't working right. So if you imagine the sentence, the dog eats the food, if that changes to the dog beats the food, it doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. And is that sort of what's happening within our genes? That's, that's a great example. And we often use an example like that when we are discussing genetic testing with our patients. So we can think of a gene as a word in the English language and words carry meaning. Genes carry signals to ourselves. And so when the code is off, the signal goes awry. And so for example, tree, T-R-E-E, -E, you substitute F, free, completely changes the meaning of the word. So that's a great, uh, great way to think about it. And then there are some times when there are mutations that don't really change the sentence, or it happens at the very end of the sentence, so most of the sentence is there, and the gene can continue to function. That's exactly right. So think of it as donut can be spelled in two different ways, D-O-N-U-T, D-O-U-G-H-N-U-T. You put that in the same sentence, it actually carries the same meaning. Got it. Um, so when we think about 
inherited um, changes in genes that lead to cancer. Of all cancer that exists, what percentage of cancer is is inherited because of an abnormal gene? And is is this a number that's continuing to change over time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so classically speaking, about 10 to 15% of all cancers are due to an inherited gene mutation or genetic change. Um, And this number has come from different sources, these estimates from different sources, some of them from the classic studies looking at families that had a lot of cancers in those families where the genes were identified. I think what we're seeing these days is a bit of a widening or um, extension of those estimates because we can do genetic testing more broadly um, in uh, patients. And so we're learning a lot more about, you know, the percentage of uh, individuals who might carry a genetic mutation that might raise the risk for cancers. What are some of the most common genetic changes that lead to cancer? Yeah, that's such a good question. So I think two genes that we must bring up in this conversation are BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, these two genes are, are really, really important when we think about um, specific cancers such as breast cancer, ovarian cancer risk, prostate cancer risk, pancreatic cancer, and potentially even a melanoma, which is a skin cancer. So uh, these two genes actually can inform if there's a genetic mutation. They can provide a lot of information about um, a woman's and a man's risk for these various cancers, um, potentially occurring at a younger age, and how to screen better for these cancers as well. And I just, you know, to add in here, really this field has significantly taken off in terms of precision medicine. And so these two genes can be really important in terms of therapies at the right time for certain patients. Sure. You know, when a um, woman comes in with breast cancer, um, she will often focus on her maternal family history. Um, And um, when one asks further and finds out that her father had two sisters with breast cancer or a sister with breast cancer and a mother with ovarian cancer, oftentimes um, that individual is surprised that there could be a genetic component. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that because the truth is it can come from either side. That is so correct and a really important point. We emphasize this a lot when we do educational events or uh, public awareness campaigns about um, really expanded views about what is family history and of cancers. And so it's so true. So um, a woman may think more about cancers in the females in the family or maybe on mom's side of the family. And a male may think about cancers in male relatives or on their father's side of the family. But these genes can actually um, raise the risk for cancers that are connected across males and females. So when we think about family history, it's really important to think about cancers that could be on mother's side or father's side of the family going up a couple of generations to the grandparents' generation or down to children's and nieces and nephews because it could be connected and it could really help inform screening and the type of genetic testing itself. So when a genetic counselor sees a patient, they take a fairly detailed family history. That's correct. Yes. The family history is very detailed. Um, And just as I mentioned, it, it really includes relatives that are Um, you know, up to the grandparents' generation, uh, the nuclear family, of course, and then also aunts and uncles and cousins, uh, because that kind of broad family history intake is really important. So um, when um, someone sees their general doctor, um, their internist, their primary care doctor, um, cancer family history is something they presumably should be sharing pretty readily. That's right. That's right. And, you know, these um, doctor visits can be very busy and a lot can be covered in the visits. So we really do encourage um, individuals, patients to bring this information to their doctors uh, in terms of when they learn new family history information about relatives who have had cancers, as I mentioned, on either side of the family, because it could really help inform and tell the doctor that this person may need to have genetic evaluation, maybe genetic testing. 
And even this family history is really important to help guide cancer screening recommendations. And over, over the past 20 years, of course, this field has changed dramatically. And the number of people who are diagnosed with cancer who undergo some sort of genetic evaluation and genetic testing has really expanded. And what, what are some of the reasons you would consider doing an inherited cancer panel in somebody who's been diagnosed with cancer? They've already yes. got the disease, but you know, wh- why do you want to find out more? Absolutely. So yes, this field has really taken off in terms of genetic testing in a person who has cancer. So there's a few clinical contexts to think about. One is when a person has, uh, let's say, advanced or metastatic cancers, there are several indications for doing genetic testing for those patients to help inform therapies, uh, which are called targeted therapies. So for example, PARP inhibitors in a patient with metastatic prostate cancer uh, could be considered if there's a BRCA2 mutation for that male. So uh, it's really been uh, growing in terms of those types of treatment decisions that could be made for those individuals. Uh, Similarly, for, let's say, a woman who has a new breast cancer diagnosis, understanding whether that uh, woman carries a BRCA mutation could be really informative for thinking of a surgical decision, whether the the shared decision there would be about considering bilateral mastectomy or localized therapy and how to plan and manage the breast cancer. Another really important reason is because, as I mentioned, these cancers can be connected to multiple cancer risks. So the same individual who may have a breast cancer diagnosis could be at risk for additional cancers. So if we understand that risk, we can also make recommendations on how to get ahead of those cancer risks and uh, manage appropriately. And in somebody who's got a strong family history, and let's say someone who has not been diagnosed with cancer yet, um, can you give someone a sense of what the chance is that they're going to have some sort of genetic mutation that places them at increased risk? Mm -hmm. So there, it really depends on a few factors in terms of the chances of carrying a genetic mutation. We rely very heavily in that uh, for a person who doesn't have a cancer diagnosis on family history, uh, because those are the kinds of factors that look that really play into understanding what are the chances of having a genetic mutation. So this family history goes back to our discussion about knowing this broadly and thinking about this comprehensively. Also, other pieces of information like ancestry can be really important to bring into this conversation uh, because certain genetic mutations are just overrepresented or at more frequency in certain populations. So we really factor in those two pieces of information to think about genetic testing for a person that doesn't have a cancer diagnosis. Well, that, that is really helpful. And we're going to continue this conversation in just uh, a minute or so. Um, We're going to take a a brief break, and I'll be back with Dr. Veda Gary to talk about cancer genetics, and we're going to move on and talk a little bit about cancer prevention as well. Funding for Yale Cancer Answers comes from Smilo Cancer Hospital, where their liver cancer program provides continued care following treatment to manage underlying liver disease and monitor for possible recurrence of cancer. More at smilocancerhospital.org. It's estimated that over 240,000 men in the U.S. will be diagnosed with prostate cancer this year, with over 3,000 new cases being identified here in Connecticut. One in eight American men will develop prostate cancer in the course of his lifetime. Major advances in the detection and treatment of prostate cancer have dramatically decreased the number of men who die from the disease. Screening can be performed quickly and easily in a physician's office using two simple tests, a physical exam, and a blood test. Clinical trials are currently underway at federally designated comprehensive cancer centers, such as Yale Cancer Center and its Milo Cancer Hospital, where doctors are also using the Artemis machine, which enables targeted biopsies to be performed. More information is available at YaleCancerCenter.org. You're listening to Connecticut Public Radio. This is Eric Weiner again with Yale Cancer Answers, and tonight I'm joined by Dr. Veda Gary, who is the Director of Cancer Genetics uh, at Smilo Cancer Hospital and at the Yale Cancer Center. Um, Welcome back. 
Um, I want to pick up on um, a, a couple of uh, topics that, that, that we had already touched on. So you mentioned that there are certain population groups that may have a higher frequency of certain mutations. I think sometimes these are often referred to as founder mutations. That's correct. Yes. And, and can you tell us, you know, a little bit about some of those populations and um, maybe the different approach you take as a genetics physician in, in counseling those people? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is one of the, uh, you know, key pieces of information when we are meeting with a patient to talk about genetic testing. As I mentioned, family history and ancestry does become important here. So one of the populations that um, we do ask about specifically is, for example, individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. So we do know that individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry do have higher rates of mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, specifically three unique mutations in these genes. So we ask about this because it really helps to think about the suspicion for carrying a BRCA mutation, um, and then really to think about the testing strategy for these individuals. Now, what I will say is it's really important to further the research and have more uh, testing of more broad populations, because this type of genetic testing where it really factors in ancestry could really be informative for identifying genetic mutations across populations. Sure. Um, and then maybe one other um, item that I think sometimes people don't appreciate is that um, let's imagine you are a woman and you have a sister with breast cancer and you wonder what your risk is. If that is your only sister, that may give you one answer. On the other hand, if you happen to be someone from a very large family and you have 10 sisters and nine of them haven't had breast cancer and one of them has, that's a little different, isn't it? That's right. That's right. And that's why having the full scope of the family history to the detail that it's possible becomes really important because we can then think about again, what would be the chances of there being a genetic mutation that would have explained that sister's breast cancer? A um, couple of other factors, though, even if a person has one sister with breast cancer, if she was diagnosed at a younger age with that breast cancer, say in her 30s um, or even early 40s, uh, there would still then be a reason to think about genetic testing for her and then also for the unaffected relatives. So, if this can provide information, why wouldn't you just do genetic testing in everyone? Yes, that's a great question. And maybe we will be there one day. We, 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 we might be headed in that direction. Um, and it's because of the nature of this testing. And so as we started off by saying that this is inherited genetic testing. So, you know, the information that we can get is not only relevant to the patient themselves, but also to their families, to their blood relatives. So it's different than any other kind of test uh, that we might be running, clinically speaking. Um, and so patients need to understand a few things about the testing itself, about that it is hereditary, what are the options for genetic testing, how big or small can we go in the gene panels, and what types of results could return that could be... Um, actionable for them in terms of making recommendations? Um, are there uncertain findings that could return and what will that mean? Uh, and then of course, what could this mean for blood relatives? I do want to bring up one important point, which is there is uh, a discussion to be had about, you know, is there any risk of financial or insurance discrimination? And that's a key part of this discussion as well to talk about what's protected by federal laws and what, what may not be. And where are we th with that? When BRCA1 and 2 first came out in the mid-1990s, there was tremendous concern about discrimination related to health insurance and life insurance and everything else. And is that still a major concern for people? So there is a federal law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, and uh, this was put into place for these specific kinds of concerns. 
Now, what the federal law covers is health insurance. So a person cannot have health insurance discrimination based on knowledge of a genetic mutation. Um, There are some insurances that don't fall under the federal law. So it's really important to know which ones do and don't. Mostly those are um, veterans and some of the other um, uh, federal plans. Um, Also, uh, employment. So employers cannot discriminate, you know, based on genetic mutation information. Again, there's a loophole there that small businesses don't qualify under the federal law. But what isn't covered is life insurance, long-term care, disability insurances. So here, if a person is otherwise healthy, and really it's the genetic information that could be deemed as a pre-existing condition only, what we do recommend is we just at least have the conversation. Um, is there any plans to get life insurance or change and how to sequence that with the timing of genetic testing? Sure. Um, no, I, those are really important issues that, that people have to consider. And then there is this entity that is commonly called, and I'll ask you to explain what this is, of VUS. What's VUS. Yes. So VUS is stands for variant of uncertain significance. So the reason that this term comes up in um, discussions, pre-test discussions or genetic counseling discussions with patients is because about 30 to 35 percent of patients who undergo what's called multi-gene panel testing, testing multiple genes at one time, will have a variant of uncertain significance or VUS identified. Now, at the time of the report, the VUS does not, is not factored into decision-making or recommendations for patients. The, uh, what we do discuss with patients though, is that the genetic laboratory actually tracks the scientific literature and new information to help the lab determine whether this is, uh, an, this uncertain finding is nothing, one of those silent changes that do nothing in our genomes, and we have millions of these, or whether it's a mutation. And if it is reclassified to a mutation, then the lab would alert our program or the ordering doctor to say, originally, we didn't know what this was, it was uncertain, now it's we think it's a mutation, and we'd want to then deliver appropriate recommendations to patients. I know that um, sometimes finding a VUS, a a variant of uncertain significance, is very troubling to patients. And um, it's something that often requires a lot of reassurance, but there's only so much reassurance that can be given, given the fact that we still need more data. That's right. That's right. And I think that's why having that informed consent or informed decision-making about genetic testing becomes really important to set the stage. If a variant of uncertain significance returns, this is what it would, this is how we use that or don't use that information in clinical decision-making. I also think a, a really important point is to limit the misinformation that could be passed along to, you know, a person may walk away thinking that that's a mutation when it's not. And so really educating uh, our patients and our families becomes very important when it comes to VUSs. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is one of the reasons why at most major cancer centers and other places that we involve genetic counselors and why genetic testing, as you're referring to, is very different than, for example, someone sending off a test for 23andMe or something like that. And understanding how to manage the results is really critical. That's exactly right. Uh, Really, genetic counseling is a, a backbone and a gold standard when it comes to delivery of genetic testing to patients and families. Um, they really, they're trained professionals who specialize in this field about genetic testing and inherited cancers and really have in-depth discussions with patients about all of these things to think about when it comes to inherited genetic testing so that the patients can feel comfortable and really arrive at information that's important for their health. And could you just talk a little about some of the other um genetic syndromes. So we talked about BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are perhaps the two most well-known, but what about syndromes that give rise to colon cancer or pancreatic cancer? 
Yeah, absolutely. So there's a very important syndrome called Lynch syndrome, uh, which is associated with hereditary colon cancer, but actually many, many other cancers as well are linked with this particular syndrome. Uh, what causes this syndrome are um, a group of genes and having a mutation in any one of those genes. These are called, in general, DNA mismatch repair genes. Um, if there's a mutation in one of those genes, then the person would be diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. So Lynch syndrome is associated with colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, upper bowel cancers, urinary tract cancers, many things. And so screening can actually begin at a much younger age or much more frequently for individuals with Lynch syndrome. Uh, that's, a, that's one of the most important other hereditary syndromes. What we are finding, though, these days is with multi-gene panel testing, many genes being tested at one time, there are a lot of genes now that are either associated with syndromes or have cancer risks associated with them. So these risks can be high lifetime risks of cancers or what's considered more moderate. And really, the recommendations would then be uh, appropriate to the gene with the mutation when we discuss uh, results with patients. Well, the the hope that we could screen and find cancers early is, of course, huge and very important. What about true prevention so that we're not just screening to detect a cancer early, but in some of these individuals who are at very high risk of developing cancer, that we could actually somehow intervene and prevent cancers. That's right. So this uh, can be done in a few different ways or discussed in a few different ways. And really, again, depends on the, the gene that has the mutation um, supported by studies and national guidelines. And so, for example, uh, one of the ways to intervene would be to think about um, surgical intervention. So is there a way to uh, remove the organ at risk such that we really substantially diminish that risk of that cancer? So for example, um, you know, woman with a BRCA1 mutation uh, could have the discussion and consider bilateral mastectomy in terms of the risk reduction and management for breast cancer risk, um, removal of the ovaries after childbearing to think about reduction of the ovarian cancer risk. Um, there are some of these uh, approaches for surgery as well for some specific colon cancer syndromes, and some of them can be as well removal of the colon uh, when the lifetime risk is high enough to warrant that type of discussion. There's other ways to think about prevention too, uh, which could be uh, using medications to help prevent uh, uh, the, the development or really kind of limit the chances of a cancer occurring. And so these are very complex and nuanced discussions that um, patients need to have with high-risk specialists. And this is a bit off topic, but when we're talking about prevention, um, oftentimes women and men are worried about when they're having a child, about bringing a child in the world who has the genetic mutation that they had that led to their cancer or their family member's cancer. And are there approaches that can be taken now to, to somehow avoid that problem? There are approaches, actually, um, in the um, reproductive endocrinology space where... Um, Really, it, there's uh, it's very sophisticated techniques where actually embryos could be selected uh, that don't carry the genetic mutation. And so it's a really important thing to bring up with the clinical team and also with doctors to be able to see if that type of service and discussion is, is, is a you know, possibility. Dr. Veda Giri is a professor of internal medicine and medical oncology at the Yale School of Medicine. If you have questions, the address is canceranswers at yale.edu, and past editions of the program are available in audio and written form at yalecancercenter.org. We hope you'll join us next time to learn more about the fight against cancer. Funding for Yale Cancer Answers is provided by Smilo Cancer Hospital.